Jacob Keyes was born on Earth in the year 2495. It's unclear how long he lived on his homeworld, but judging by his love for the Navy, it likely wasn't all that long. He only had one sibling, a sister that eventually lived on one of the United Earth government's outer colonies, a planet called Dwarka. Her name and current whereabouts are unknown. During his early life at officer training school, Jacob Keyes had one particularly gung-ho instructor that made plans to test out some brand new calculations that he hypothesized would allow for faster slipspace jumps. Slipspace was humanity's primary means of interstellar travel, utilizing an alternate dimensional space to enable faster than light locomotion. That doesn't mean transitioning from point A to B was instantaneous though. Even moving at speeds that were effectively faster than light, trips to far off planets sometimes led to days, weeks, or months of travel time. After all, the universe is an incomprehensibly vast place. Due to the complex mathematics involved with this advanced form of travel, Jacob's teacher miscalculated, and in his eagerness to test his theory, the young Jacob and his classmates were afflicted with plasma burns, a very nasty and uncomfortable sensation, to say the least. Due to his negligence, the military instructor was to be tried in a court of law, and thanks to the overwhelming amount of evidence stacked up against him, his trial would surely be swift. Despite his injuries and the fact that his teacher was obviously guilty of causing them, Jacob refused to testify against him. The young officer candidate was loyal, as loyal as they came. While he refused to fold, his classmates did not, and frankly, why would they? Their teacher was the cause of lots of pain. That didn't seem to matter to Keyes, though, and it was because of this secret-keeping ability that he was selected by a young Dr. Halsey to assist her in collecting the children for the Spartan program. Her purpose was to evaluate candidates for this program, but the catch was she needed children, which meant they had to obtain them via less than pleasant means. The first child they aimed to inspect was a young boy living on a planet called Eridanus II, a child named John. Jacob, currently a lieutenant, was quick to ask Halsey the purpose of this particular mission, clearly not understanding why he had been sent on what appeared to be a simplistic objective that basically amounted to babysitting. He had joined the UNSC Navy to fight against rebellious terrorists, not watch over a woman doing whatever it was they were doing. Needless to say, Halsey was vague about their goals. Though he theoretically could be trusted without consequence, she didn't want to provide him with any information he didn't currently need. Despite his curiosity, he quickly understood that Halsey was in charge of this mission, and so it was his job to follow her lead. Once they arrived on the surface of the planet, the two of them assumed a cover story that they were a young couple searching for a school to enroll their daughter in, and approached an area containing a group of kids playing. One child, as it turns out, the one they came here to inspect, was atop a small crest in the landscape, kicking the shit out of any other kids that tried to make their way to its apex. Keyes and Halsey watched, quickly realizing this boy, Candidate 117, was exactly the type of kid Halsey was looking for. With no other adults in sight, Halsey strode forward and began speaking with the kid. Jacob stayed slightly behind, merely watching the two of them converse, recording their interaction from afar, and no doubt fiddling with an old school pipe that was once his grandfather's. Fidgeting with the archaic inhalant had become something of a habit, and he took comfort in holding it or simply chewing on the end of it. Once Halsey concluded her conversation with the boy, she returned to him and he expressed confusion. He still wasn't exactly sure why they were here or what the purpose of that exchange was, but when asked for clarification, Halsey did not provide it. Instead, stating that it was good he didn't understand. It was better to not know what exactly they were doing. The child had passed Halsey's little test, and with that accomplished, they moved on to the next candidate. Time went on, and planet after planet, child after child, Keyes had started to put two and two together. What was most likely one of the last candidates he was present for was a boy named Soren. This child had a very rough upbringing, thanks to the fact that his mother and stepfather had died of a disease, forcing him to live on their farm for quite some time completely alone. His story is actually far darker than that, but that's best kept in another video, which is already on my channel. If you're interested, go check it out. Link in the description and maybe on screen or whatever. In part due to this trauma and likely in an effort to ease her own conscience, Halsey did something different when approaching Soren. Instead of abducting him as she'd done with John and many others before him, she offered him the choice to come with her instead. Keyes wasn't exactly sure why she'd done this though and asked her if it truly was a wise decision, putting such a heavy burden on a small child. He had begun to discern the purposes of their little meet and greets and though Halsey believed he hadn't quite put everything together, he was close enough to the truth. So likely not long after, Halsey had Jacob reassigned to a ship called the UNSC Megalon. She had developed a fondness for him in their time together, and so in what was perhaps an attempt to save him from truly knowing the horrible nature behind the abduction of the many six-year-old children, she simply had him removed from the situation. Seven years went by until Keyes would be reunited with Halsey when he was attending an unknown conference at a university. Both Jacob and Halsey were surprisingly happy to see each other again, and before they knew it, they had decided to stay the night together. <laughs> Thank you.
and it was here that their daughter, Miranda, would be conceived. He'd also bump back into John and the other Spartans a year after, but they didn't seem to remember him. Jacob would eventually be assigned to the UNSC Meriwether Lewis, where he'd sustained serious injuries in a battle with the Covenant. Due to these injuries, he was temporarily sidelined and given a teaching position in a naval academy on Luna, the Earth's moon. He taught here for a while, and though he would have preferred a more proactive position aboard a ship poised to fight with the Covenant, he did as he was told. Halsey had also sent their daughter to live with him because she was afraid she'd be unable to give the girl the attention she needed. Miranda grew very close to her father in this time, and Jacob found himself quite content raising her. A few years later, 2535, he was summoned aboard a ship called the Armageddon's Edge. The spacecraft traveled to a planet called Chai Ro, and Keyes met up with several of his superiors. It was here that he was given the choice to become a member of a new ship's crew, a vehicle that had been dubbed the Midsummer Night, captained by a man named Zhang. He wanted the position, but a part of him was somewhat hesitant to say yes and leave his daughter behind. Ultimately, though, he accepted. On his way there, he had met a hotshot Pelican pilot named Jeffries, who he had taken a liking to. After he agreed to being part of the Midsummer Night's crew, he had Jeffries reassigned to the same ship. Their goal was to ensure nearby civilian spacecraft followed the newly issued Cole Protocol, a stringent order issued by the UNSC that was designed to prevent the Covenant from capturing a human ship and subsequently learning the location of Earth or some other human colony. A few days into their patrol, they'd come across a vessel called the Finnegan's Wake. With a contingent of ODSTs, Keyes boarded the civilian craft and informed its captain that they needed to clear his ship's nav data in pursuant with the Cole Protocol. The cargo hauler protested, but Jacob didn't care. They were at war, and they couldn't risk the chances of the Covenant getting a hold of any of their navigational information. As the ODSTs moved throughout the ship, one of the cargo containers within the hangar they'd boarded exploded, knocking keys down and sending a few of the men flying. Jacob hit the ground hard, and quickly after, he passed out. When he awoke, the area was in complete disarray. Several of the cargo containers had been outfitted with explosives, and as it turns out, they'd unknowingly stepped directly into an insurrectionist trap. He, the ODSTs, and the Pelican pilot he'd brought along with him, Jeffries, had been wounded, and in that time, someone had triggered a distress beacon hailing the Midsummer Night. Bizarrely, none of the soldiers had actually hailed their ship, and with that information, Jacob surmised that their attackers had done so. Likely, they planned to detonate more bombs within the ship to destroy the Midsummer Night as soon as it approached to provide assistance to those who had sustained injuries from the initial explosion. He had no intention of allowing this to happen, and so he quickly devised a counter strategy. He ordered the soldiers to load the dead into one storage crate in the wounded into another, then blow a hole in the ship big enough to push the crates through. Thanks to the armor the ODSTs wore, they could all survive the vacuum of space for a short time. Using that window, they planned to propel themselves through the zero gravity by a rigged explosion and the use of battle rifles to launch towards the Midsummer Night and away from the Finnegan's Wake. Keyes quickly ordered one of the ODSTs to climb within the storage crate that contained the wounded men and strip off his armor. These cargo containers could be vacuum sealed, so they'd be safe inside it. The ODST protested, but Jacob was sure of his scheme. He donned the armor the soldier had taken off and they all worked to set his plan in motion. They got to work as fast as they could, and eventually Keyes made his way out of the hole they'd created first in case the rebels were wise enough to put guns on their exit. But fortunately, they floated through space without consequence. As they got further away, the Finnegan's wake got smaller and smaller in Keyes' vision. He had gained a considerable lead on the ODSTs, and he could just barely make out the cargo containers they were holding from afar. Suddenly, the enemy ship exploded. Apparently, the insurrectionists had figured out their plan wasn't going to work, and detonated the explosives they'd planted to try and kill as many of the UNSC soldiers as they still could. Jacob watched in stunned horror as the blast enveloped many of the soldiers and flung others far off course. In his mind, his mission had been a horrific failure, and he didn't deserve to be serving alongside the men and women that had just been killed. Once he was ferried back to the Midsummer Night and was looked at by the crew's doctors, he was able to take notice of just how many people lived thanks to his plan and ability to analyze the situation so clearly. If it weren't for him, they'd likely all have died in that explosion. With that grisly experience behind them, they were ready to receive new orders. This new objective had them tracking the source of a sudden increase in Covenant weapons on the black market in the hands of insurrectionists. They need to figure out where where they came from and why they were ending up in the possession of rebellious humans. Sometime later, Keyes was walking through the midsummer night when he received word that something had happened to Jeffries. If he had succumbed to the injuries he received on the Finnegan's Wake, Keyes would never be able to forgive himself. He's the one who had him reassigned to this position, and if he had died, he felt as though his death was on him. He rushed down one of the many hallways within the ship and was suddenly attacked by some of the same ODSTs that he had fought alongside in the rebel ship. He tried to wrestle free, kicking and punching his attackers until they lifted him up and cut off one of his shirt sleeves. With his arm exposed, the Helljumpers began tattooing their symbol onto his arm. 
He relaxed and stopped fighting back as soon as he realized what was happening. Due to his heroism and good calls, they considered him to be an honorary ODST, and this tattoo was a sign of their respect and admiration. The supposed problem with Jeffries was seemingly only a ploy to get him where the ODSTs can conduct their little ritual. Continuing on the previously established mission of tracking down Covenant weaponry in the hands of rebels, Keys and the crew of the Midsummer Night traveled to a planet called Charybdis 9, where they had a potential lead on the source of the artillery. Once there, Jacob stepped onto the surface of the planet and met up with an informant that had been working on the ground. Together, they moved towards a trailer that contained a mobile command center. Within it were several Oni agents and tons of reconnaissance gear that they'd clearly been using to keep an eye on the local populace. Once Keyes was inside the trailer, their informant, who had manufactured an identity and befriended a key suspect in the illicit weapon trade, headed out to initiate their plan. The goal was to obtain information from the rebel in hopes that they could discern where exactly these weapons were coming from. As they conducted their op, an angry mob of citizens started rioting not far from their position and had begun making their way towards the surveillance pack trailer. They'd have to move fast if they were going to get the info they needed. With no other option, the men within the Oni contingent quickly busted out to give their informants some much needed aid. With a swift rifle butt to the side of the rebel's head and a few zip ties, they had captured him and planned to interrogate him for the information they sought. As this all went down, Keyes watched everything unfolding from a monitor inside the trailer. Without warning, the opposite end of the command center erupted into flames and Jacob was flung to the side. Fire shot across the inside of their hiding spot as he scrambled to get out. They had been hit by a sudden barrage of RPG projectiles and the previously angry mob was now more scared and confused at the display in front of them. Their confusion quickly transformed back into rage as all hell broke loose. The rioters suddenly grabbed one of the Oni agents and beat him to a bloody pulp. Keys and his cohorts needed to be back now or they were all dead. As quickly as they could, they made their way towards a nearby building and started climbing their way to the roof. Once there, they called for Jeffries to get them the hell out. As he pulled in, RPG fire shot towards him and using his piloting skills, he managed to dodge the projectiles. Without warning, a rocket struck the belly of the aircraft. Chunks of the Pelican's guts and inner machinery rained down as another RPG struck the vehicle again. Keys watched in horror as the aircraft came down with a loud crash and he was forced to come up with a new plan of escape. Despite being in shock and stricken with grief at watching the man he was responsible for bringing along perish, he managed to be clear-headed enough to radio the Midsummer Night. They needed reinforcements now, before the angry mob ripped them to shreds or rocket launcher fire turned them into nothing but human-shaped ash stains. Fortunately, the ODSTs that he had befriended had been brazen enough to leave earlier in the event that something had gone wrong, but even with their smart preemptive move, they wouldn't arrive for at least 20 minutes. That meant that Keys and the other survivors from the exchange needed to hold out on the rooftop with almost no ammo against a force far greater than their own limited number. Just before the ODSTs finally arrived, Keys killed someone, a human being. This was the first time he had been forced to do so and the act made him feel sick. Backup soon came, and once it did, they made short work of the terrorists so that they could all evac to the midsummer night. As they were flying out of the planet's atmosphere, their sensors picked up a large signal approaching their position. It wasn't the UNSC and its source was very big. That could only mean one thing. The Covenant were on approach to Charybdis 9, and their arrival left only one possible outcome, the complete and total annihilation of the planet. Keys immediately started strategizing and planning for ways to aid the citizens of the hostile world, despite the fact that many of them clearly wanted to see him dead. As it turns out, the informant that he had initially met on the planet who had infiltrated the rebel group outranked Keys and told him the unfortunate truth. Moments before their firefight on the surface of the planet, one of the rebels accidentally let slip the origin of a new shipment of black market covenant weapons. They were coming from a ship called the Kestrel and with that lead, Keys needed to pursue it. Having the Midsummer Night fight the incoming covenant forces in a last stand was a waste of their lives and UNSC resources. They needed to prioritize determining the source of these weapons. Keyes didn't like it, but good soldiers follow orders, and so he somberly did. After Keyes arrived back on the deck of the spacecraft he had been calling home, Zhang began making an announcement to the entirety of his crew. Displays throughout the ship lit up with feeds from across Charybdis 9 as the Covenant rained hellfire upon them. Buildings crumbled and fell while lakes transformed into scalding hot vapor in a mere instant. Glassing beams dropped onto them while the planet's meager defense force tried and failed to prevent the apocalyptic scenario. Zhang had the crew watch as this all unfolded as a grim reminder of why it is they fight. In the words of the great Thor Odinson, rage and vengeance, anger, loss, regret, they're all tremendous motivators. Some time later in the Midsummer Night would successfully track down the ship called the Kestrel. Stealthily, they followed it for a while, hoping it would lead them to the source of the Covenant armaments. As they trailed the vehicle and approached a gas giant, a bizarre superstructure suddenly entered their field of view. A series of asteroids that had been somehow connected together via tubes sat before them. 
ships moved in and around them, and as they watched, they realized what they had stumbled on. This wasn't just an insurrectionist base. This was a sprawling metropolis, haphazardly built by human hands and hidden behind enemy lines. They were able to spot a jackal or Kigyar made ship floating among the space rocks as well, evident by its shoddy craftsmanship which set it apart from traditional Covenant vehicles. This was likely the source of their black market weapons. Cautiously, they eased the ship through the many freighters and rocks that made up the city when suddenly one of the bridge crews stood and started shouting. Before Keyes could process what was happening, she fired shots at Zhang and other people in the area. Keyes rushed her and desperately tried his best to wrestle the gun from her hand. She screamed at him and fought as hard as she could, revealing her true allegiances. As it turns out, she was a rebel sympathizer and wasn't going to allow them to attack the structure they had discovered, a place she was calling the rubble. As Keyes fought against her, he realized she had ingested some kind of stimulant, and in her drug-addled state, she aimed the weapon they were fighting over at herself and pulled the trigger. The shot rang out as her brain splattered against the wall and the proximity of the noise deafened Jacob. The entire bridge crew had been seriously wounded, especially their captain, Zeng. Before they could recover, missiles began striking the ship's hull. The rebels within the rubble had taken notice of them thanks to an interior explosion that the murderous bridge officer had likely set off. More and more weaponry struck their hull as the individuals within the superstructure started healing them. Zhang had made his way to the ship's nuclear warheads, and even in his broken state, he managed to jettison them, not only as a sign of peace, but to prevent any rebels from getting their hands on the weaponry. He responded to the rebels' hail and explained what he had just done, requesting that his crew be treated fairly. He asked Keyes to approach him, with his dying breath, had him initiate the Cole Protocol, purging the navigational data within their ship's systems. He followed the command, hesitating slightly as he realized that by doing this, they'd have no way to make it home and he'd likely never see Miranda again. With Zhang's death, Keyes had become the ranking officer, which meant that he was now in charge of the ship and completing the remainder of their mission. With no other choice, Keyes and what now compromised of his crew exited their ship and allowed themselves to be funneled through a series of security checkpoints. A woman approached a nearby podium, and her voice amplified out and across the hollowed-out asteroid they were currently within. This individual, clearly someone possessing a leadership role in this unusual place, spoke directly to the crew of the Midsummer Night. Despite their allegiance to the UNSC, they were being granted the opportunity to attain citizenship if they so desired. She explained that the rubble governed their people through voting. Every voice was equal, carrying the same weight. That even extended to Keys and his people, provided they adhere to a few guidelines of their creation. These people foolishly believed that humanity had the chance of joining the Covenant and that the war they had been waging on them was thanks to the UNSC. Keys knew better, of course. The Covenant didn't care what kind of person you were, your beliefs were irrelevant. If you were human, you would die. Once the woman finished explaining how Keyes and his people could be integrated into their society, he and his ODST compatriots noticed that many of the crew appeared to be seriously considering this option. He couldn't exactly blame them given the circumstances, but the ODST's leader insisted that Keyes at least try and say something to dissuade them. So he did. He stood high and spoke, delivering the best speech he could muster, and as a reward for his efforts, several of the rebels' security arrested him. He had denied citizenship, and as a result, he was to be jailed. There was nothing he could do but accept it for now. It's unclear exactly how much time Keyes remained in this prison, but it likely wasn't that long. A sudden commotion echoed throughout the halls of the jail Keyes had been thrown in. The guards appeared to be panicking, attempting to fight something, and they were losing. A colossal gray figure suddenly appeared before him, a Spartan. Completely unbeknownst to Keyes and his crew, a contingent of three of the super soldiers, an outfit called Grey Team, had infiltrated the rubble some time ago and had been staking it out ever since. The Spartan introduced himself as Jai, and now that he'd freed them, he explained that they needed to infiltrate a Kigyar ship, the same one that Jacob and his cohorts had seen on their way in. Needless to say, Keyes and his ODSTs were more than happy to oblige. They quickly got to work on a plan to board the Jackal vehicle, and did so. Once inside the ship, they made short work of its occupants, but in the chaos of the conflict, the ODST's leader and the man that had helped tattoo their sigil on Key's arm was killed. With heavy hearts, they proceeded to purge the navigational data within the ship's systems. Immediately upon completing the objective, a large signal appeared just outside the rubble, a Covenant Armada. The worst part? They had no real way of fighting back, until Keyes had an idea. The rubble was currently being evacuated on account of the incoming invasion force, and as each asteroid was emptied, it essentially became irrelevant. In order for the superstructure to even exist, each rock was outfitted with thrusters that constantly made micro-adjustments to keep them in place. These engines could be used to hurl the habitats at their enemies. With the asteroids covering their exit and the navigation data from the ship the Spartans had traveled there with, they had a chance to escape. 
Once the civilians of the rubble had been loaded into a particularly large asteroid, the creators of which had dubbed Project Exodus, the giant rock charted a course for several random slipspace jumps, in accordance to the Cole Protocol, of course. After the random jumps, they traveled to the nearest of the UNSC's outer colonies, much to many of the inhabitants' collective chagrin. After arriving, Keyes reported to his superiors and came face to face with the hero the Cole Protocol had been named after and created by. Admiral Preston Cole. Thanks to Jacob's efforts, a million civilians were able to live to see another day. Such bravery and intelligence in the face of dire odds meant a reward was in order, and so Admiral Cole promoted Keyes to the rank of commander, officially giving him leadership of the Midsummer Night. Before setting off on a new mission, though, he decided to take some well-earned family time. He headed back to Luna, where he'd finally see Miranda again after many weeks of being away. He was thrilled to see her, and for the time being, he was pleased to simply be a father instead of a commander. Many years after the rebel conflict and his time aboard the Midsummer Night, Commander Keyes would eventually take control of a ship called the Iroquois. At the time, he and his crew were drifting not far from a planet called Sigma Octanus IV, a world with millions of human beings on its surface. Suddenly, a sensor relay picked up a large incoming attack formation. The Covenant were inbound, two frigates, a destroyer, and a carrier. As soon as he realized what was coming, he contacted his superiors to request backup. The UNSC ships almost never won space battles, so his craft would get completely eviscerated without help. A few more ships headed his way, but they wouldn't arrive for another hour. That meant they were on their own. The enemy vessels materialized in their field of view, and Keyes instantly started creating an attack strategy. They were outgunned in every possible way, but Keyes was smart, and he had a plan. As you know by now, he was beyond an excellent tactician. He ordered his crew to plot a course that would take them straight into the path of the Covenant Destroyer. They were going to ram it. As their ship rapidly approached, blindingly bright plasma projectiles ejected from the Covenant crafts, hurtling towards the Iroquois. Before they could make their way to their target, the human ship impacted with the Covenant destroyer, causing its shields to fail. The plasma bolts that had been trailing them suddenly made their way home, but instead of killing Keyes and his crew, they burned through the surface of the ship they had just rammed. Important systems melted away as the ship suddenly lost power. Keyes then had his crew fire a salvo of deadly archer missiles at the craft, and as they impacted, it was instantly pulled towards the surface of Sigma Octanus IV. While they were launching towards the destroyer, they had passed by the frigates and had fired a nuke in their general direction, but their attention had been completely drawn to them. They were ignoring the warhead. The Iroquois continued on its course, flying towards Sigma Octanus IV and using the planet's gravity to slingshot them around the other side of the celestial mass. Just then, they detonated the nuke. The blast was tremendous, but wasn't enough to destroy the two frigates. That was never the goal, though. The resulting explosion caused the ship's shielding to fail, and in that instant, Keyes commanded the Iroquois to fire Mac rounds and missiles at the unshielded targets. All of their shots were executed perfectly and both ships were destroyed. The remaining Covenant craft, a carrier, was bugging out, seemingly fleeing from the situation. It wasn't like the Covenant to run scared, though. Something was off. As it turns out, they had deployed formations of dropships to the planet's surface, but that was the Marine's fight, and his ship was in desperate need of repairs after the altercation. While the Iroquois was being repaired, Keyes decided he was going to take a break, to give himself a few moments to recover after the beyond stressful battle. He attempted to relax in his quarters when suddenly a man strode into his room. It was Admiral Stanforth. He had come to congratulate him on his insane maneuver, which many had started calling the Keys Loop. For his success, he was being given a promotion to the rank of captain. Jacob was in shock. He had never expected to achieve such a thing, but he didn't have time to celebrate. During his brief sabbatical, sensor probes had detected a large force of Covenant ships headed their way. The Iroquois wasn't even close to fully repaired, but it didn't matter. They had to get back to work. A deadly battle raged above Sigma Octanus IV as the human and alien vessels fought desperately against one another. Instead of charging headlong into the fray, Keyes commanded his crew to pilot the Iroquois towards any broken Covenant ships. Their spacecraft had sustained far too much damage from their previous engagement, so the best thing they could do right now was eliminate the partly decommissioned ships. As they repositioned to do so, they suddenly noticed a very small Covenant vehicle above the surface of the planet. It appeared to be some kind of stealth craft, and based on what the Iroquois was detecting, it was receiving a signal from the ground. Keyes surmised that whatever it was must be important, so he had his crew fly their vehicle towards it. Their missiles couldn't seem to track it, so instead, they'd ram it out of the sky. The Iroquois made its way towards the relatively small alien vehicle and smashed into its surface. Thanks to the human ship's bulk, it completely obliterated the vessel, and moments later, the remaining Covenant ships started fleeing the scene. Once again, this wasn't right. They seemed to have won the battle, but whatever signal the Covenant was receiving from the planet's surface couldn't have been good. Whatever the case may be, shortly after, he received new orders from Admiral Stanforth. He was to head to Reach to be debriefed on something new. As per the Cole Protocol, he ordered his crew to generate several random slipspace jumps before finally making their way to Reach. But little did the crew realize that a small sensor had attached itself to the Iroquois that would keep track of every location the human ship traveled to and send that information to the Covenant. 
Once Keyes arrived at Reach, he sent the Iroquois in for repairs, and during that time, he made a brief visit to see Halsey, where the two caught up on their lost time. They discussed Miranda, his Keyes loop, and the Spartans. Eventually, they parted ways, and as a goodbye, Keyes kissed Halsey on the cheek. After all, it may very well be the last time he ever saw her. While at Reach and attending the debriefing, Keyes would come face to face with someone he had not seen in many years, John 117, now known as the Master Chief. Keyes was happy to see the boy, who was now very clearly a man. He had grown into quite the soldier, one of the best humanity had ever had. He no doubt felt a sense of pride in his continued success, despite the obvious guilt that was also present. He had been there at the very beginning, after all. After a brief conversation, Chief passed Jacob and went inside to speak to the same superiors Keyes had just spoken to. Every single active Spartan II in the area was summoned to reach. With them all collected, Keyes and Halsey met them to give them their newest set of orders. Their goal was to disable a Covenant ship, kill its crew, infiltrate their computer systems to find the location of their homeworld, pilot that ship to said planet, abduct the Covenant leadership, and finally return to UNSC-controlled space with them in tow. Keyes had been put in charge of a new ship. Pillar of Autumn, as the Iroquois was far too damaged to take into battle. It was up to him and his crew aboard this new vessel to disable the Covenant ship for the Spartans to then board it. The plan was crazy, but it was one of their last chances, a last ditch effort to slow the Covenant assault on humanity. Keyes made his way to his new ship, the Pillar of Autumn. One of the bridge crew gave him a tour, explaining all of the modifications the ship had received and all of the unusual features it boasted. It was an odd but extremely impressive vessel. If any ship could do what they were about to attempt, it was this one. The Spartans were already on board, so Keyes decided to pay them a visit. After that, he made his way to the flight deck and commanded the ship's AI, none other than Cortana, to prepare their launch to slip space. Just moments before they could make the jump, an Alpha Priority transmission came in from Reach. The Covenant had found them, and they were under attack. Reach was beyond important to the UNSC, and so the Pillar of Autumn hightailed it back towards the planet as quickly as it could. When they arrived, a grim scene sat before them. Tons of Covenant ships were raining hellfire upon Reach's orbital guns, and worse yet, even more had managed to deploy ample ground troops to the planet's surface. That didn't stop Keyes from fighting back, though. Using his piloting skills and with the help of Cortana, they eliminated a Covenant flagship, but even with its destruction, more came to take its place. During their space battle, all of the Spartans had been reassigned elsewhere. The original plan had been superseded, and they instead focused their efforts on defending Reach. Most of the Spartans were deployed groundside, while the Chief and a few others had entered a damaged human ship to purge its drives of navigational data. After accomplishing that goal, Keyes rendezvoused with them and picked them up. With Chief on board and Reach now seemingly a lost cause, Keyes determined that they needed to refocus back on their original mission of capturing the Covenant leadership, but first, they'd need to make a very brief emergency pit stop on the surface of the planet. Halsey was in possession of a fragment of Cortana, meaning the Cortana that was within the Pillar of Autumn's systems wasn't quite whole. Before they left, they'd need to retrieve the other piece of her consciousness, then exit the system. Once they made their way to the planet's surface and the Pillar of Autumn was outfitted with additional temporary thrusters to help propel its immense bulk off of the human world, Keyes boarded a pelican to meet up with the individual that was delivering the Cortana fragment to him. A Spartan he didn't recognize met him at a landing pad and handed Keyes the AI fragment. This Spartan was Noble Six, a Spartan III that had been reassigned to a Mjolnir equipped team mostly composed of Spartan Threes, save for George, the group's only Spartan II member. Six planned to join Keyes on his short flight back to the Pillar of Autumn, but sadly, Covenant forces in the area were too thick, and someone needed to operate a nearby anti air gun to watch their exit. Keyes understood, and though he didn't know the man, he no doubt admired him for his sacrifice. With his flank secured, he and the crew accelerated away, and shortly after exiting Reach's atmosphere, he ordered Cortana to prepare the ship for a randomized slipspace jump. She followed the order in pursuant with the Cole Protocol, but instead of going somewhere truly random, she piloted the ship to some coordinates she had taken from the signal they had intercepted over Sigma Octanus. Once they entered slipspace, as usual, the captain and the crew entered into cryosleep. A few hours before arriving at their destination, Keyes was awoken by Cortana, and as soon as they exited the strange void state, a bizarre object was floating before their collective eyes. A large, impossible artificial ring world. Halo. Almost immediately after dropping out of slipspace, the Pillar of Autumn was attacked by Seraph fighters. Though they had escaped Reach, their fight wasn't over. Shortly after commanding a few longswords to pursue the enemy fighters, Keyes started telling the other awake crew members to start thawing out everyone else that was aboard the ship, namely the Master Chief. Keyes waited in the bridge, staring at the strange alien structure they discovered until the Chief arrived to meet him. The Spartan was weaponless, so Keyes handed him his personal sidearm, an absolute beast of a magnum. 
Though it left him defenseless, he knew the chief would need it more than he did. His plan was to land the Pillar of Autumn on the object they found and begin initiating the cold protocol. Cortana was still within the ship's system, so Keyes told the chief to take her with him. They couldn't risk her capture by the enemy. At this point, the Covenant had already started boarding them, which meant the risk of them obtaining navigation data that could lead them to Earth was high. Keyes ordered all non-essential crew to abandon ship while he and the bridge officers remained. They'd pile into the last few escape pods after they ensured the pillar would land on the ring. Once Keyes was satisfied the ship would land as best as it could, he made his way towards the final lifeboat. Moments before, he had noticed a strange visual shimmering on the bridge deck, a translucent blur. He instantly knew he wasn't alone, but with no weapon in hand, the unwanted visitor would have to think it had gone unnoticed for a little while longer. Keyes headed towards his life pod with several other Marines awaiting his arrival outside. He stepped inside as the craft prepared to disengage from the Autumn, and as calmly as he could, he approached one of the Marines aboard the ship. He extended his hand and requested the soldier's sidearm. In a quick motion, Keyes raised the pistol and pulled the trigger, letting loose several rounds into the camoed mass. As soon as the bullets exited the chamber, an elite appeared and slumped onto the ground. After they landed, they stripped the lifeboat of supplies and headed off across the ring's surface. The Pillar of Autumn came down over their heads and crashed somewhere far off in the distance. Seeing his ship damaged like that gave Keyes a twinge of sadness, especially when its status flashed before his eyes, thanks to the neural implant he possessed that connected him to the vessel. Needless to say, it wasn't in good shape. Covenant patrols had instantly started to pursue them, so they spent most of their time hiding as they moved across the ring's Earth-like landscape. Banshees flew overhead, and instead of blasting them to oblivion, they simply flew by. This behavior was strange, to say the least. They hadn't killed them from above when they easily could have. Keyes wondered why. As did one of the individuals present in their ragtag group, a woman named Dowski had made it known to everyone that she thought they needed to surrender. She was losing it, and no matter what anyone said to her, she continued to complain and insist on the ridiculous notion. Keyes thought for a moment before telling the rest of his crew to leave her behind. If she wanted to give herself to the enemy, she was welcome to, but her spastic actions weren't about to slow the rest of them down. So without question, as the rest of her compatriots had also clearly grown tired of her incessant complaints, they bound her and left her for the Covenant. Hours later, a Covenant dropship floated in above their heads. Unbelievably, the voice of Dowski amplified from it, telling everyone just to stop because they had nowhere else to go. They really had taken her as a prisoner. A moment later, and the troop carrier landed beside them. Dowski stepped out of the vehicle, followed by an elite and several grunts. The elite yelled at the grunts to collect the human weaponry, then turned to Dowski and, in crude English, asked her which of the humans was their shipmaster. She pointed to Keys. In the instant she did, the Elite unloaded on the rest of the crew, killing them all instantly. Dowski looked terrified before the Elite pointed a magnum at her head and pulled the trigger. Keyes was the only survivor, and it seemed they wanted him alive for some reason, so the Sangheili warrior grabbed him and threw him inside the spirit. The Covenant soldiers ferried him to the Truth and Reconciliation, a Covenant ship that had parked just above the ring's surface. Once inside, they tortured him extensively, probing him for information. Specifically, they wanted the location of the Master Chief. Keyes had no idea where the Chief was or why the local Covenant forces were so intent on finding out, but if he did, he would never tell them. His attackers left for the time being, leaving him stuck in the cell with nothing but his thoughts, which no doubt drifted towards Miranda, his loyal crew who had been gunned down in front of him, and maybe even Halsey. Suddenly, the sounds of small explosions echoed from somewhere beyond his position. The staccato rhythm of gunfire followed by the screams of jackals and grunts dying traveled through the ship's long halls until they reached his ears. He heard a door open, and much to his amazement, the Master Chief strode forth and interacted with a nearby control panel. A few button presses later, and the hard light wall holding him in his cell faded from existence as the hardened photons scattered away. The chief approached him and extended a hand, and once he took hold of it, he was jerked to his feet. Coming here was reckless, but he couldn't deny that he was happy to see John, happy to see the boy he met all those years ago. In his time within the cell and during his interrogation, he was able to glean some new information about where they were. The Covenant called this place Halo. In that instant, Cortana searched the Covenant battle net for references to the term and pulled up tons of useful information. Most importantly, she was able to determine that the Covenant knew Halo was a weapon. Keys didn't like the sound of that and instantly devised a rudimentary plan. If Halo was a weapon, they had to prevent the Covenant from gaining control of it. So, Keys told the Chief to pursue a lead Cortana had found, which would supposedly take them to the Ring's control room, but first, they'd need to get out of here. With the Spartan taking point, Keys scooped up a needler and fell in behind him. John was an absolute machine, working his way through the ship's dark and purple halls, eliminating any Covenant forces that got in their way. Eventually, they made their way towards a hangar bay, and parked within was a spirit dropship. With no other way to exit, the Chief, the surviving Marines that he had found along the way, and Keys piled into the alien ship. Jacob was one hell of a pilot, and somehow knew how to fly the foreign vehicle, using it to splatter a few hunters before making their escape. 
The human forces on the ring had established a base on its surface, and so Keyes steered their newly acquired ship towards it. Once they arrived, the chief set off to find the control room, and Keyes started to familiarize himself with his temporary home. After a bit of a self-guided tour, he had a conversation with a man named Major Silva, who he quickly discovered had a deeply rooted problem with the Master Chief. After explaining that his worries regarding the Spartans' operational efficiency were completely unfounded, Silva left Keyes alone with his thoughts. Some time went by, and Keyes eventually received a radio transmission from the chief in Cortana. They hadn't found the control center, instead they had stumbled upon some kind of math room. Meanwhile, Keyes was dealing with his own new developments. Namely, they had captured many Covenant prisoners and had begun probing them for valuable intel. One elite had made mention of a weapons cache that he had delivered to a nearby swamp, and so Keyes, accompanied by a group of marines, headed to the location. Once they arrived, the captain immediately made note of the fact that the area looked vacant and that there wasn't really any evidence of Covenant activity, contrary to the elite's supposed confession. There was an odd structure in the swamp though, so they continued onward, despite his growing suspicion that the alien's info was nonsense. The further into the facility they went, the more eerie everything became, especially when they stumbled upon a unit of dead elites whose chest cavities had been completely ripped open, seemingly from the inside. A growing sense of unnerve no doubt creeped up his spine, but regardless of it, they pushed forward into the complex. After a few minutes of walking, they made their way to a small door. The Covenant had worked hard to lock it down prior to their arrival. That was strange, but it also made sense in a way. If this was a weapons cache, they'd want to keep it out of enemy hands. One of the Marines accompanying him managed to get the door open, revealing a large empty room on the other side. They all stepped in and surveyed the area, but found nothing. Suddenly, a radio transmission came through a local frequency. It was a Marine, and his voice was stricken with panic. He babbled about some kind of strange new enemy that was unrelated to the Covenant, but it was difficult to understand what he meant. The soldiers screamed in anguish, and the transmission abruptly ended. A few tense moments passed when, without warning, dozens of small, bulbous, blob-like creatures assaulted them. Everyone frantically fired bullets into the creatures as a torrent of their bodies washed over them like some sickly green floodwater. One of the creatures flung itself onto his back and drove a tentacle deep into his flesh, then grabbed a hold of his spinal cord. Unimaginable agony washed over him as the pain blotted out his consciousness. Before he could pass out, the creature pumped his body full of a vile liquid that kept him awake for a few extra moments. His limbs went numb, and his mind became clouded as something else entered it. When he regained awareness, he found himself in a large open room. A horrific buzzing sound filled his ears, and his arms felt wrong, as if they'd been filled with a warm liquid. Memory suddenly started jumping to the forefront of his awareness, intense and realistic. He remembered a beach, the first time he killed a human on Charybdis 9, the moment he graduated from his naval academy, his father's casket, and the smell of flowers from the funeral arrangement. Each time a memory surfaced, it vanished shortly after, leaving only a hole in its place and the feeling like something had been taken from him, but he was never able to discern exactly what. A strange and terrifying presence, distinctly separate from his own awareness, seemed to be lurking within his mind probing his deepest thoughts and desires. Something had started to nag at him, a thought, an idea on the tip of his tongue, just barely out of his mind's reach. Then it hit him. It was his own name. He'd somehow almost forgotten it. Keys, Jacob, Captain, service number 01928-19912-JK. How could he have forgotten his own name? He went over it again in his mind. Keys, Jacob, Captain, service number 01928-19912-JK. The droning sound he had heard before was back, but louder than ever. A distinct feeling of anger washed over him, but it wasn't his emotion. He wasn't angry, just confused and scared. Then he realized what was happening. Something, somehow, was searching through his mind. He had been captured by the enemy. The Covenant, he remembered. Yes, that must have been it. They must have been torturing him again, in some new, far more horrific way than before. No, that wasn't right. This wasn't the Covenant. It was something else. Something older, angrier deadlier, and so, so hungry. More memories flashed through his mind, and each time they were erased shortly after. This entity within him was searching for something. They wanted Earth. That had to be it. Keyes suddenly had an idea, focusing his thoughts towards the transponder that had been implanted into his head. It was connected to both his mind and the physical world. He had to hold on to it to keep himself, his sense of who he was, from slipping away. Keys, Jacob, Captain, service number 01928-19912-JK. This other, it wanted Earth. No, it wanted more. It wanted everything. He wouldn't give it what it wanted. He couldn't. He fought as the being dredged up a memory of his home planet, its booming voice eclipsing the image. Where, it had said. Keys knew what he had to do. He had to feed it memories, sacrifice the things that made his life worth living, and give away the very essence of who he was. He stuffed the thoughts it wanted as far down as he could and recalled something else, anything else. Voices suddenly penetrated his ears. Was this a memory or was this real? The sound of the Master Chief and Cortana. 
It was real, they were here. He summoned every ounce of strength he possessed and called out to them, telling them to leave, to run, to get the hell out of this horrible place. Keys, Jacob, Captain, service number 01928-19912-JK. He didn't want to forget, but he had no other choice. He couldn't let this presence know where Earth was. Memories of Miranda surfaced and he cried out, no, please don't make me forget. The presence of the other was suffocating and its voice, though inside his mind, was unbelievably loud. It spoke to Keys, saying he didn't need memories anymore. He didn't need his previous identity. All he ever was, was now theirs. Keys, Jacob, Captain, service number 01928-19912-JK. Memory after memory, thought after thought, and eventually nothing else remained within him. His name, navigational charts, and the awareness that they needed to be protected from something, he couldn't remember what, was all that remained. The chief's voice, he suddenly remembered. He managed to speak again, ordering him to pull out now. He desperately clutched at the memories he was hiding, fighting so hard that this other presence within him seemed surprised at his resistance and strength. Suddenly, an immense force impacted on the captain's forehead. He felt no pain. A wet crunching sound reverberated through his skull as a gauntleted fist plunged through the soft tissue and took hold of his neural implants. With a quick jerk, Keyes was gone. Though Jacob died before the end of the Human Covenant War, the impact he had on the conflict was great. His heroism, his loyalty. In the end, it was instrumental in humanity's continued survival. His contributions to John's life and his own personal struggles helped save all of humankind. He would be remembered. Okay, that's all I've got. Thanks for watching. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go play some Halo.